1964, Valerie married Daniel Ma, who is the son of the first Chinese Presbyterian minister. <laughs> and uh, maybe you know that they would, you, they would do that. But anyway, so they had the order from Montreal. By the time it came, it was half yellow, mm -hmm. you know. But by that time, Dad had just decided not to supply. Um, growing up Chinese, it was it was uh, it was difficult because we had the old men. They used to there were a lot of single men. They used to come to our farm on the Sundays when they had time off, and uh, my mom would cook Chinese meal, and then it was a family life away from home, and. Um, then they even taught, tried to teach my brothers um, English, uh, Chinese, and uh, but they wouldn't. I shouldn't say that because I get upset. But uh, they wouldn't let me join because they said they keep on saying no good, no good. You know, because you're Chinese, you're a girl. And uh, but anyway. Um, it didn't last very long because my, my brothers and weren't interested in learning the Chinese. Um, <coughs> at school, the teachers were very kind to me, and um, but some parents didn't take. Like I had a very favorite little girl friend, and uh, she took me home, and the mother slammed the door in my face. And I couldn't understand, and they said because I'm Chinese, and uh, so that's. I don't want to think back too much because I'm a little cry baby. <laughs> but uh, I, but ask him. I don't cry very much. But no, no. I mean, could, back. I mean, Mary's talking about a very personal, like yeah. it, that's her story, her history. So it's very. I mean, it's. I mean, we really appreciate your sharing your stories with us, but I understand how um, emotional that can be. And it made me made me think about um, my mother, because she, uh, my mother is Jean Lum, and she was Jean Wong, and grew up in, um, she was born in Nanaimo and, and grew up in Vancouver. And she had to quit school because um, to support, to help work, to support her family. And she had an older brother, a younger brother. She's from a family of 12, but it broke her heart that she had to quit school because preference was given to the sons. It was more important that the sons get educated. So my mother had to quit school for that reason. So when you mentioned that story, it reminded me of um, you know the difference, how women were, the girls were treated um, compared to the boys. So I just wanted to, to carry on with what Valerie was talking about, and you were talking about, like, Mary, you don't want like, you Chinese New Year, you're supposed to clean your house by, before that, that first day. But uh, what other customs were celebrated? I mean, Valerie, you talked about Qingming, and that's the, the festival when you go um, visit your family cemeteries. And, and so what, were there other festivals or celebrations that were... There's a lot of superstitions. I, I know when my dad died that one auntie came to the house and she screamed at me because I was wearing red slippers. I mean, you know, you're wearing slippers, you're in your own house, but because my dad had just died, we shouldn't have been wearing anything like that. And I remember thinking, my dad died, and all these women came in, and they cried, and they went carried on, and the minute they walked out the door, they started laughing, and it really, you know, was, seemed so hypocritical that they felt that way. But um, my mom was, uh, you know, she was very strong and, and uh, she carried on running the restaurant and everything after <coughs> my dad died. Dora, did you celebrate any Chinese festivals or Chinese New Year? We celebrated Chinese New Year. It's always with uh, food and like, see, the, the Hong Bao. And because my mother is Zhong San, um, they have their particular customs. So my mother would get. Um, Called a pomelo, nasati nyo. The pomelo looks like a grapefruit, and uh, she would line up the. She was, I'm sorry, I start to laugh because it's so funny. She would get the pomelo and put them on our piano, and she'd put a little uh, uh, mandarin orange on the tops of, of each one. It looked quite comical, 
but she said that's what they do uh, in Jonsan. My mother also took us to the temple in Victoria. If any of you ever get to Victoria, there's a very well-kept secret. There's a, 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 a one of the oldest Chinese temples in North America in Victoria, and it's a Hakka temple. My mom's not Hakka, but um, it was brought over by uh, Hakka rail uh, Hakka workers when they were building the railroad, and it's called the Tanggung Temple. And I remember walking up to it. It's still there. You walk up, you walk up with like 90 stairs. And then you got to the very top. It was always very dark. And you go inside, and there was a, a large dome. Now, in the 1970s, the temple caught on fire. Much of the inside burned down. The only thing that didn't burn down was the, the little wooden deity that was mm -hmm. there. So it was all rebuilt. And they still have candles burning in there. So when you walk inside, it's like you've stepped back into um, probably like the uh, 18th century China. And it's open to the public if you wanted to go up there, have a look at it. So we used to go there and we were, we're kind of irreverent because you know when you're a little kid you really don't understand that the what looks like a little bed to you on the floor is where you're supposed to kneel and not jump up and down. <laughs> <laughs> and that when uh, Yusuf Gong, the fellow who looks after the temple, when he bangs on the gong, you're not supposed to be yelling and screaming and <laughs> things like that. But uh, if you get a chance, you should, you should, in your Victoria, you should visit the temple. Okay. Um, we, we, you've touched on it. I mean, I, I made reference to the fact that you're, you, you can bring, a, you bring a very uh, unique perspective coming from small town Canada and being among the few Chinese in your community. What kind of um, community activities or organizations did your family get involved with, either yourself or your families? that of course wouldn't have been Chinese based, would have been um, your small uh, communities organizations? I think for, for my parents, my, my dad uh, worked at the, um, he owned the Embassy Cafe and he ran it with uh, his cousin after my uncle passed away. And what I recall is my father would um, be out of the house every night until 11 o'clock. So there wasn't any uh, any time for him to actively become involved in any community activities. And in Prince George, there are no buses. Uh, and there weren't any taxis there. So my mother would just load up the kids with a carriage, and we would walk to the downtown area to go shopping. The only thing I remember my mother doing in Prince George was um, visiting uh, a family, <coughs> or visiting my, my father's cousin family, because there were really so few families there, but we didn't get involved in uh, the church at that time, um, primarily just school activities like sports. Um, after school, we built igloos in our front lawn, and we had a skating rink in our backyard. So it would sound like the quintessential uh, northern BC you know, uh, childhood. Well, my mother um, grew up in North Bay, and I remember I mentioned that it was the missionaries, and, and so she had, she had more of an English background, and she'd say to us, when you go to a place, watch what, what fork and spoon they're using, and then just follow, do what they're doing. And so therefore, the early days, it was the missionaries that you know taught my father English, and then they did go to church earlier. But then there came a day, you know, when they were running a restaurant. You're running a restaurant seven days a week. So mom was up front and dad was in the back. And maybe if we were lucky on our birthdays, he would come and have supper with us. But the rest of the time, you know, two and, and eight o'clock, the dad had supper. And so mom would be, um, she would be up front and, and uh, working the restaurant. But she did start to integrate. Like there were actually five girls and a boy in our family, and I was the fourth girl. So that was the one that you know, like who wants the fourth girl? But my brother was the next one, and so my mother ended up. You know, she went to the scouts with him, and when he practiced piano, he she would sit on the bench, and I used to be rather resentful of the fact that she, you know, she because he was the first boy and the only boy. But um, but mom did end up, you know, in a small town, a Chinese woman working seven days a week in the restaurant and she ended up as the the head of the Boy Scouts Association the you know the mothers and then she went became the head of the horticultural society and then also she was uh, she won some awards in restaurant after that but it was a really tough life we had to get our vegetables you talked about it the truck went from Toronto to Montreal and loaded up the other end and that's how we bought our Chinese vegetables when my dad was alive he grew vegetables in the backyard. And the other hard one was the cooks. 
it's hard getting cooks to go to small towns. And so I was in Toronto by this time and my mother would say, okay, go hang up the sign. And what it is is they would rewrite a sign in Chinese, you know, uh, a position in Brockville. And so I would have to go down to Chinatown to a certain store and hang up, take scotch tape and hang up the sign. And then that person would pick it up if he wanted a job and go down to Brockville, take the train and you have to pay for the train and you have to pay for going um, back to Toronto once a week. For a woman to be running a restaurant in a small town and relying on on that kind of help, and I know that you know um, you, you just had you you did you couldn't interview them. You had to just take whoever happened to come along. I know one one cook followed a waitress into the into the basement, and we had to get rid of him. Um, but so you know, can you imagine what it was like? You have to rely on them. So she was up front, and and so you know, more power to her that she worked that hard. I can't add too much to that because um, my parents were just too busy working on the working in the farm. And the only thing I can think of is he always made us sure that we went to church and Sunday school and the minister used to come to the house and they were really kind people. You know, I've heard um, you've been talking a lot about what your experiences were growing up. You've touched on what it would have been like for your mother or your grandmother. Maybe can you talk, just expand a bit more about how do you think or did you hear from your mother or grandmother what it was like for them growing up in your small uh, town? Growing up in, I mean, being in Canada, not speaking English and being very isolated, like what kind of stories did they tell you? Well, like I said, my mother was uh, bought and she worked as um, Moje, which is like a maid for the family in Vancouver. And uh, so she, um, and then it was, uh, when she was of age, they, uh, that was 16, uh, my father came along and even though he was 16 years her, her uh, senior, they married her off and um, so she didn't so it was really traumatic the, the train ride because she didn't know anything about sex later on she didn't know anything about childbirth and so it was she had a very very rough life and then um, she was then um, work on the farm that was hard because, you know, she's used to hard work, but she was emotionally and uh, physically abused. And uh, But the beautiful thing, she always had love for her children, even though she had a rough life. And that makes us where we are today. And how many children altogether? Uh, we have um, five brothers and two, two girls. So a family of seven. So yes, that would have been a very busy household. Busy, busy, but uh, like I said, the uh, all the emphasis was on the boys because uh, they said eventually the the girls are going to leave, which we did. I did. <laughs> My mother used to tell us, uh, because there's, I don't know how they did this, my sister Alice, a year and a half later, my sister Ruth, five years in me, a year and a half later my brother, and then uh, uh, five years later was my, my sister Gloria. And I, when my sister Gloria was five, I said to mom, well, is, am I going to get another brother or sister? And she gave me the dirtiest look, you know, at that time. Um, she used to work, um, our bedroom was, at, my brother and I, our bedroom was in the front. And the office, we were just above the office, and she told us, if your sisters are mean to you, you just let me know. You take your, your shoe and pound the floor. And I can remember one night, Joe and I were crying away, pounding the floor. They're hurting us, they're hurting us. And nobody ever came. <laughs> my grandmother she, Dora probably knows more because she interviewed my uncle and my grand, I, did you meet my grandmother? No, my, my mother too. Um, they were, she was in North Bay and so without the language and so on, they would be more isolated. The interesting thing is that as a school principal and, and having retired, I've now gone around the city to meet some of the other people who, you know, other, other administrators and I've run across a number of Chinese principals, males and females, 
Interestingly enough, they all have had the same background, small town, laundries, and restaurants. <laughs> And I just wanted to add to that. I always I joke around that my family is Chinese Canadian royalty because we paid the head tax and we also worked on the CPR, so we have a very distinguished bloodline. <laughs> my mother's background was was uh, very interesting in that uh, she was born here, and um, she refers to herself as the. Uh, poor daughter from a very rich family. So my grandfather was a, a gambler and he didn't spend much time looking after the family. So my great grandfather decided that he would eventually send the entire family, all Canadian born kids back to the village because he had a house there. They would at least have a roof over their head. My mother had said that when, um, by the time she was seven, she was the eldest uh, child in the family and, and girl. She was uh, selling cartons of eggs, going knocking on doors in Vancouver. And um, they lived in a house that had, had no heat and it didn't make any sense because their family was a wealthy family. She'd have to go down to her, her grandfather's store and she said, if you can imagine a little kid just pacing back and forth, building up the courage to go, go talk to your grandfather and say, uh, oh, we have nothing to eat. Can we please have some uh, um, bread? and some eggs. So my great-grandfather packed up the entire family, sent them back to the village, and my mother's, I understand, I understood this after uh, I became older, that my mother's an entire uh, outlook on the world was shaped by her experience in, in the village. And so they got stuck there during the war. And uh, my great-grandfather was sending money back, but then when the war broke out, my uh, three uncles came back on the very last ship to leave China, and the rest of the family got stuck in China. And so when the Japanese invaded, um, as, as many of the villagers were, my grandmother was beaten. And so they eventually fled to Hong Kong, where the family richly starved because they weren't able to get any money back. See, my mother was very, very tough. She was a very tough woman, and she was very, very strong, and she had this um, uh, uh, steely uh, strength to her that I never understood you know, as, as a child. And it wasn't until I interviewed her when I was doing graduate studies that all of a sudden all of this came out, and then I, uh, I was able to uh, see her you know, in, in a, a different light. And up until that time, I couldn't appreciate why this woman was, um, why she so rarely smiled, and, and why things just never made her happy. It was because she herself had such a really hard childhood, and, and uh, what my grandmother also had to endure. It was very difficult. So I just wanted to ask, um, We've been given a lot of context what it was like for you growing up in your small community, being among the few Chinese people, but I wanted to ask you, what were your own personal and professional aspirations within that context? I wanted to be a veterinarian, and then I realized I didn't have that uh, Chinese math gene. <laughs> And so when I couldn't even, I struggled through math. It was terrible. I had to change my, my profession. Um, but that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Yeah. I, I ended up studying Chinese-Canadian history, which uh, I was so fortunate to, to have the opportunity uh, to do that, because it's carried me for the last 30-odd you know, years. That's be Valerie. Yes, I met Valerie because I, I was the first recipient of the Chinese-Canadian History Fellowship. And I was on the committee. <laughs> and, now this is the part that you probably didn't know. I'd applied for the fellowship, but I never applied to U of T. So I got the fellowship to come out, and there was a postal strike at that time. So I told them I had already submitted my application, but it must be stuck in the postal thing because of the strike. So I had a, an application career out here. And then when I got to Toronto, I, real, I learned that there were no courses in Chinese Canadian history. And my professor said, that's okay, you just have to create some courses for you, and so I learned about Chinese Canadian history by studying uh, immigration and ethnic studies with Robert Harney. And that's how I met Valerie, yes. 
<laughs> and Laura, how is it that you went the next step to become, you went into the law profession and now you're working in human rights, which is, it seems to flow, but just what was that next step from studying Chinese history and then going into law? I learned a lot about uh, the, the history of the community just by talking to my aunts and uncles and my father. Bob Harney had said to me, I actually started becoming interested in Chinese Canadian history when I was in high school. And uh, at UBC, I studied Asian studies and I learned about the China side because it was.